Good evening, everyone. Welcome back from the uh, Sukkot's vacation. And um, we're dealing with some of the uh, halakhic positions of the Rebbe, Bav Shrebi, that is. And uh, I'd like to deal with uh, issues that some of them, in fact, were pretty relevant this past Yom Tov. The Rebbe, the Ahira, and this, this really from the Sechelik Dalit, that's volume number four of the Kutus Sichos, of the work of the Rebbe. And he's dealing with uh, what constitutes an interruption that would require a person to make a second bracha. For instance, Yom Kippur. We have a break in Yom Kippur around, uh, in our show, I think the break went from around 3.30 to a quarter to a quarter to six. So it was a break around two and a quarter hours. <clears throat> Many people will leave shul, take off their talis, come back two and a quarter hours later, and put on the talis again. Is that considered to be a half second a call interruption from the initial bracha, and therefore would that require another bracha or not? That's something which happens each and every year when we have the Yom Kippur break. Then uh, let's go from Yom Kippur to the Sukkot issue. We had uh, this year certain times when it was raining in the Sukkah. And um, you probably know, we've talked about it many times, that in halachic, uh, in halacha, if it's really raining hard and your prayer is going to ruin the food, a person technically doesn't have to eat in the Sukkah. But in Chabad circles, and I think in most Hasidic circles, they eat in the Sukkah, not just Chabad, but especially in Chabad, they eat in the Sukkah. Chabad is interesting. On the one hand, where a lot of people, especially in the Yeshiva Shavelt, uh, many of the people sleep in the Sukkah. Chabad does not sleep in the Sukkah. But in terms of eating in the Sukkah, uh, even if it's raining quite hard, we do eat in the Sukkah. The basic idea is that by Hasidim, by the Baal Shem Tov, he made the centerpiece of his, uh, of his service to HaKadosh Baruch was uh, serving God with Simcha, with joy. And when you are joyful, as the Simcha Baruch gathered, joy is able to break through all different types of boundaries, and a person can maintain their joy even if the weather was inclement. And in fact, it was... Um, it was uh, I don't know, it was a, I think the second day of, Suk- of Sukkot. Sukkot was on Wednesday, but the, the following Shabbos, there's the famous uh, uh, comp- the competitive game between Michigan State, at least Lansing, and U of M, University, University of Michigan of Ann Arbor. And they played the game just two weeks ago in the stadium of Ann Arbor were, I think, 106,000 people. 106,000. And it's an open stadium. And it was raining that Shabbos afternoon, cats and dogs. Terrible rain. And it was pretty cold also. And nevertheless, this, everyone stayed in the stands and they, and, they, and they roared and they shouted and they screamed and yelled. And they're all excited because they just were happy about this game taking place, which is, you know, once in a, once in a year this game takes place. So it's all mind over matter. If you're excited about something, then you're not distracted by the rain. But Hasidim because Simcha was such a central theme in all Hasidic movements. And, and the, the Simcha of, of sitting in a sukkah, I mean, that yesterday was the earth site of the great Tzadik of Levi Yitzchak Badichev. When he did mitzvahs, he did it with an incredible amount of excitement and joy and Simcha and, and warmth. They say when, in fact, it was, it was two days after, when she was, after the sukkah ended. Uh, but uh, they say that uh, after every sukkah, if they're not putting on film for nine days, when they finally put on film the next day, the first day after the sukkah was over, they would have to hold him down because he was so excited about the upcoming mitzvah that the fear was if they wouldn't hold him down, he would drop the, he would drop, drop the film. So therefore, by Hasidim, because simcha and joy is so central, uh, therefore, if a person truly is joyous, you're not going to be bothered by the rain, especially if it's not that cold outside. And I, I remember times in in Michigan, we had snow. Remember, we had the, one time, I think, with 10 inches of snow in Sukkot. But if there's no snow and the weather is not too uh, cold and it's raining, it's really no big deal whatsoever. You know, perhaps in times of the Gemara, people did not have the, uh, I think, the rain types of garments that made it easy to be able to be in the rain and enjoy yourself. But today, there's really very little excuse for not uh, eating a Sukkot when it's raining. Because if, if you dress correctly, it's like being at the uh, U of M game. If you dress correctly, you're able to shout and scream and, and uh, holler even if it's, uh, there's a big rain going outside. Whichever way. But the, the point is, this past week, we had people who were in the sukkah, for Yom Tif, 
and they started uh, pouring, and they left the sukkah to go into the house to wait until it stops. Or to talk and schmooze with the woman who in the house who didn't go out to the sukkah. They come back an hour, an hour and a half later to end the suda. So the same question, do you have to make another bracha of Le Sheba Sukkah or not? Is it called a hefzik? Is it called a separation? What's called an interruption that separates you from the initial bracha to the sitting in the sukkah? So again, a person made a bracha of Le Sheba Sukkah, sat in the sukkah for 15, 20 minutes, started pouring, went down and back into the house to schmooze a bit or to dance a bit or to sing a bit. If you do want to eat, of course, you're only outside the sukkah. You come back an hour and a quarter later, what do you do? So these are issues which the Rebbe discusses in the, as I said, this Chelek Dal, that's volume 4. The good is in the back, is on page uh, 1363. So the Rebbe brings up an interesting point, that the al Rebbe himself, al Rebbe, the first Rebbe, Balatanya, seems to uh, vacillate <coughs> from issue to issue. Why? al Rebbe writes in Shulchan Aruch and Arachayim, Concerning the sukkah, the person again made a relation with the sukkah, left the sukkah, and the other Rebbe says that if you did not return right away to the sukkah, but you waited an hour or two, then you wait an hour, so you got to go back and make a bracha relation with sukkah, and then you keep on eating. One hour, two hours. Which will raise the question if, if you have to make a new bracha after one hour, why is it necessary to mention two hours? So that's one statement of the Alter Rebbe, that the person leaves the sukkah. You made it again, you made it for those who just came, the person made a bracha, left the um, of the relation with sukkah, sit in the sukkah, started raining, left the sukkah for an hour, an hour and a quarter, comes back later to finish off the meal. Do they have to make another relation with sukkah? <coughs> another bracha? So the Alter Rebbe says, yes, if you left for an hour or two, you have to now make another bracha when you return to finish off the meal. Again, another bracha of Leish Masukah. That's one thing that Adam writes. That's in chapter 639, paragraph 13, Arachayim. Rabbi, is that, is that if you stopped eating altogether, what if you went inside and continued eating, you could still see your sukkah through the... Or is it you have to stop eating and everything? person was, was in the sukkah, left the sukkah, and doesn't want to eat outside the sukkah because he only eats in the sukkah, came, and came back an hour later to finish the meal. That's a half second. Okay. Then the Alter Rebbe, Roshan Zalma, brings another issue, and that is in chapter 25 in Arachayim, paragraph 29, talks about tefillin. person, let's say, who who was wearing tefillin and, has, and takes off the tefillin, let's say, to, to eat something. Doesn't want to eat with his tefillin. That's, that's another issue. To eat with tefillin on. You certainly can't eat a regular meal with tefillin, but if a person wants a snack, he really can. But this person decided that he wanted to take a breakfast and he would go back to put on his tefillin. So he had out there, talks about not, not one or two hours. He said, if, if, you, if, you, if you did not put back your tefillin on for another two, or th- if it took you two, three hours to put back your tefillin, then you have to make another bracha. So when it comes to sukkah, the author says, one or two hours is called an interruption. When it comes to tefillin, it's two or three hours. Why the difference? And then the other issue is if even one hour it, it constitutes an interruption, an interference. If a person ever leaves the sukkah for one hour and comes back later, if, if even one hour constitutes an interruption, then two hours certainly is called an interruption. Why would the al Rebbe then have to say both? And uh, <clears throat> and the al um, not the al the Rebbe himself mentions that these issues are discussed in the Sefer called Ksosa Shulchan, from Rabbi Chaim Noah. Chaim Noah, I think, died in the 50s, or maybe early 60s. And there he talks about the laws of tefillin. He talks about this issue of a person, let's say, made a bracha with tefillin, took it off because they wanted to eat, eat something, eat breakfast, comes back to put on the tefillin. So Rabbi Chaim Noah brings from a Rashi in the tract at Yuma. There he talks about the issue not of the Leshiva Sukkah, not of the Bracha with Philem, 
But the issue of making a new bracha, person was eating, eating. And you made a bracha with your food, and then you left your house, or you, let's say you didn't leave your house, you got you got a, got a, t- a telephone call, an important business call, and you forgot about your meal. And then it was a long call, two, two and a half hours. So do you have to now make a new bracha or not? So the Rebbe says, so Rashi brings down in Tract of Yuma that if a person for an hour or two was diverted his attention from eating, then he has to make a new bracha. So that's also dealing with the Suda, dealing with the idea of the bracha of the, of the food you're eating. Another issue. And Rabbi Chaim Noah says very categorically, he says he, he doesn't see any logical difference why there should be a difference between tefillin and sukkah. So why is it when it comes to tefillin, now that Rabbi says two or three hours, when it comes to sukkah, the Rebbe, now the Rebbe says one or two hours. That's called, that's called interruption. So they said, Rebbe Chaim no, does not find any sort of a logical reason why there should be a d- distinction and difference between tefillin and sukkah. But the Rebbe says there is a difference, and that's what the Rebbe's approach is. The Rebbe says, talk about another issue. Let's say a person has, you know, you have a Torah obligation of saying the Shema or at least rabbinic obligation. There's the Torah obligation, according to most of the authorities, the obligation of the Shema. There are three sections of the Shema. We have the Shema Yisrael itself, that first word, that first the line that is in Baruch Shem, plus the first paragraph, V'avta Yisrael Lekecha, which ends with V'sharecha. That's one paragraph. Then we have the second paragraph, V'hayam Shema Yitishmu, if you will listen. And that whole paragraph. Then we have the third paragraph dealing with the midst of tzitzis. So, the third paragraph is certainly really a separate mitzvah, because the end of the paragraph we say, I'm the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. And that's a totally different mitzvah of remembering the Exodus. Every day we've got to remember the Exodus. Which really is separate from the other paragraphs which deal with the mitzvah of the Kriya Shema. Now, why are they lumped together? Why did our chazal, why did our st- sages put them together? The third paragraph, which is the mitzvah of remembering the ex- Exodus, even though it deals primarily with sisters, nevertheless it ends off with the mitzvah of remembering the Exodus. So if that's the mitzvah of the Exodus, why was it lumped together with Shema Yisrael? I don't want to get into that. Now, the author talks about this in Tanya, I'm sure many other commentators deal with that issue. But they're really two separate mitzvahs. But in terms of the Shema Yisrael itself, which really the, we have the Shema and Vahoya and Vahaf, the second paragraph, Vahim <coughs> Shema, the third paragraph. Well, let's call it better the Shema is the first line. Vahaf is the first paragraph, Vahim Shema is the second paragraph. So there are opinions that say the Torah obligation is only the first statement, first uh, statement of Shema Yisrael, Shema Lakan, Shema Achad. Everything else is rabbinic. The Magan of Ram and Shulchan Arach. Uh, follows the second opinion, the, uh, another opinion which seems to be a normative opinion, that is the mitzvah, the Torah mitzvah, uh, is not just the first statement of Shema Yisrael, but the entire first paragraph. And the second paragraph, following Shema, that's rabbinic. There is a third opinion that all, all of the paragraphs are tyrannic. But be it as may, whether it's tyrannic or rabbinic, we have an obligation of saying the Shema every day, the entire Shema. Even if it's rabbinic, it's still uh, an obligation. Or we have the obligation of saying the uh, Amida every day, the entire Amida. What if a person was saying the Amida and some emergency happened, you just had to stop davening? Emergency. These things happen. You finished half of the Amida, and then the emergency is over with. And now you want to go back to the Amida because you have an obligation of saying the entire Amida. You only said half of it. Can you, go, uh, can you go back just to the place where you stopped? Or do you have to go back all the way to the beginning? So the Allah is, that really depends on how big that interruption was. If it takes you, let's say it takes for an average person, let's say five, six minutes to say the Amida, beginning to end. 
because it takes you six minutes, that's what the meeting is. So if the interruption, as we said, in the middle of the meeting, you got an interruption. Some emergency was happening. You got an emergency telephone call. You became aware of it. You had, to go, you had to take care of something. Or you saw something happening. A robber was coming in. You had to scare him off. So if the interruption was more than six minutes, that's called interruption, which separates that uh, Shemon Esrei, and so to say, destroys the Shemon Esrei. And at that point, you cannot go back to where you, uh, where you stopped. You've got to go back all the way to the beginning of Shemon Esrei. Because then it takes you six minutes to say Shemon Esrei. And you, made, and you said the first half of it, and then you have this eight-minute interruption, because the eight minutes is more than six minutes. That's called an interruption which separates, and that separation means that you can never make up for the Shemon Esrei unless you go back all the way to the beginning. Same applies to the Shema. A person, say, in the middle of the Shema, you get this, uh, something emergency nature happens, something, your, your child falls down and starts screaming. And you have to attend to your child. It takes you uh, 10 minutes to quiet your child down, calm them down. And you got you have, you know, something which you have no choice, you got to take care of this. Or another sort of a, an emergency that happens that you really have no control over. So if the interruption is more than the time it takes you to say the Shema, to say the Shema can take, let's say, four minutes, three, four minutes to say the entire Shema. So therefore, three, four minutes constitutes a total interruption. And therefore, that interruption splits it up in a way that you can never be corrected unless you go back to the beginning. That's what the Rebbe says. So the Rebbe points, points, this, points this out. And he says the following, that um, therefore, there's a difference between a person who was eating in a sukkah, or a person putting on fillin, or let's say a person putting on tzitzis. As I said, on Yom Kippur, we, had this, we have that each and every year. We have usually finished Yom Kippur davening most of it around 3.35, 3.40. And we have a break which is a little more than two hours. So many people leave the shul, and before they leave the shul, they take off the talus, take it off for a couple of hours, two and a quarter hours. So Rebbe says the idea of splitting up, whether it's the sh- talus issue, what's called the interruption for a talus, or as opposed to a sukkah. Where again, the Rebbe says that when it comes to a sukkah, he talks about one or two hours. So there, again, a person was in a sukkah, and for whatever reason he left, whether it was raining or some other reason, he left the sukkah, and it got there. He left for an hour or two, he was eating the sukkah. He left for an hour or two, and he comes back, got to make a new bracha. As opposed to tefillin, where the Alter Rebbe says two or three hours. That's called an interruption. The person was wearing tefillin, took him off to go someplace, and waited two or three hours. The Alter Rebbe says, you wait two or three hours, you got to make a new bracha. And when it comes to tzitzis, the other Rebbe says, after many hours, if a person took off the talus, and then many hours have passed, and you come back and you put in tzitzis, then you have to make a new bracha. So the Rebbe says the following. When it comes to a sukkah, what's called an interruption by a sukkah? Even though it's true that the Shulchan talks about sleeping in the sukkah, and as we mentioned, Chabad does not sleep in the sukkah, and there are really two reasons for not sleeping in the sukkah. Brought down in the Ramah and Shulchan it's, it's not really a Lubavish thing. The Ramah who was in Moshe Isolis, who lived in Krakow, who lived in Krakow in the 1600s, he said that in Krakow people did not sleep in the sukkah for two reasons. One is that it was too cold. The Mishnah that talks about the lachas of sitting in sukkah, sitting, eating in sukkah, and sleeping in sukkah. The Mishnah is in Eretz Yisrael. Eretz Yisrael during sukkah is very temperate. Sleeping in a sukkah in sukkah's time in Israel is is great. There's no there's no rain, very little rain, and it's not not cold at all. But in Rav Moshe Yisrael, it comes from Krakow, where it was very cold in the, in the, in the winter or in the, in the fall time and times, like, in a, like here in America. Many times we have very frigid sukkahs. This past sukkah, sukkahs of this past year of 2017 was really, was really great in terms of being very temperate. So there are more rights that um, 
the reason that it seems most people did not sleep in sukkahs in Poland, or at least in Krakow, was that it was too cold. And also, ideally, if a person is married, husband and wife should be together in the same sukkah, sleeping together in the same as a bedroom in a sukkah. And that's just not practical anymore. It's just not done. But the, but the Ramah does recommend trying to do it, try to have a separate bedroom in your sukkah for a husband and wife, but practically speaking, it's not done. But whichever way, even though there is a concept of sleeping in the sukkah, the Adrebi says, there's no question, we, the bracha we make of uh, 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 Lashem of sukkah is, ma- is made only over food that we eat, not, not sleeping in the sukkah. <clears throat> so, the Rebbe says, in terms of if we're eating in the sukkah, says, Ikeg was a And in terms of eating, in terms of the meal time, so the Rebbe's convention is that a meal in, the, in halacha, a meal takes around an hour. Where does he get this from? So the Rebbe says he brings, he marshals a Gemara in Brachis, tractate Brachis, which is the first tractate in Shas, 55a, where the Gemara says that in the times of the Gemara, people would have not three meals, not breakfast, lunch, and supper, but two meals. And the words corresponding to the Korban, there were two, uh, there were two communal sacrifices offered every day in the base of English, once in the morning and once late in the afternoon. So the Gemara says there in Tractate Brachas 55a that the meal that we eat is, um, which should be twice a day, is al derech hakrov is carbon similar to the communal sacrifices offered twice a day, and the Rebbe also marshals another excerpt from Tract Epsachim 55a that the communal offering it took the Kohanim an hour, one hour, to perform all of the different uh, services connected with the communal sacrifice, which corresponds, which we said our suda the morning suit that we have, the morning meal, corresponds to the communal sacrifice. And then the Rabbi also brings um, the Gemara Mishtat Shabbos, where the Gemara there talks about when people would usually eat. The Gemara says it's regular people. Most people in the Gemara's time is when they would eat their breakfast, would not just get up and eat breakfast. We get up, usually the crack of dawn. Just remember in the Mars times there was no electricity, no light. So you had to use your daylight, every precious moment of daylight. People got up at dawn. And people, the first three hours, did not eat. Did not eat a meal. They went to shul, they might have worked a bit. The first meal was always in the fourth hour. So if we look at the 6 a.m. as when the first hour enters, the fourth hour begins 9 a.m. The custom is people would eat from 9 to 10. As the word says there in Shaq and Shabbos, that's 10a, where it says, Shari, Shaina, Piyash, Bazeb, Basha, Achad. People would eat during this entire first hour, or the four, fourth hour that is. And the Rebbe also marshals the Gemara in Shaq above Messiah, 83b, that says that on the fourth hour, as I mentioned before, on the fourth hour, nine o'clock, was when people, between nine and ten people started eating, people would eat their first meal. So therefore, if we go back to the, we say the halachas of Shmon Esrei, that it takes someone six minutes to say Shmon Esrei. And let's say you start doing Shmon Esrei, and then you had an emergency in the middle, you had to stop. So one is it called the interruption that really, uh, so to say, um, an interruption that um, delegitimizes the first part of the Shema Nasser, if the, if, the, if the stoppage of interruption is more than six minutes. Here also, because the length of a Suda was people would take an hour of time for, for a meal, beginning to end. So therefore, if you left, you're in the, if you're in the sukkah, eating in the sukkah, and it started raining. For whatever other reason, you had to leave the sukkah. If you leave for more than, more than an hour, that constitutes a separation. 
an interruption, and therefore when you go back to the Suda, to the Sukkah that is, you're going to have to make a new bracha. Now, why did Rashi, th- why, why did Yathra mention an hour or two? If, if you were saying one hour is called an interruption, then two hours certainly is an interruption. So the Rebbe says, because it's brought down <coughs> in, Mar- in, in tract at Yuma, He brings down, the Gemara says, Haraitze Sherich Chayav. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, there's attracted brachas. It says, a person wants to add longevity to your life. It says, prolong the time it takes you to eat. Digest your food better. Don't eat quickly. If you want to live longer, don't eat quickly. So if a regular person eats for an hour, a person who wants to live more and a person who has more time will eat more than an hour. So therefore, the Rebbe says, since it's more than an hour, for to such a person, what's called an interruption, whereas by a regular person, interruption would be an hour. For someone who takes more than an hour, the interruption would be close to two hours. Or as long as it's more than one hour, what's more than an hour? So we talk about two hours. That's why the Alter Rebbe says both an hour or two. What about davening? So let's go back to the davening issue. So if we talk about davening, together with putting on your talus and taking up its fill-in and seeing all the preliminaries of the davening. Davening officially begins with the hodu. Put all preliminary. So this will take more than an hour and a half. Because the Alter Rebbe writes in the Geras Kodesh, which is in Tanya, the fourth book of Tanya, he asks his Hasidim to daven at a minimum of shachras, an hour and a half each and every day. And the Alter Rebbe says, and the Rebbe says that there is a foundation of this in the Zohar. So since a person davening is more than is more than an hour and a half. So therefore, when a person davens with filling on, and most uh, most filling is usually done when you're davening, that's why the Alter Rebbe talks about two or three hours when it comes to filling. Because most people will daven the way the Alter Rebbe expected people to daven. Today, one could argue maybe people daven less. Many people spend less time davening. But in the Alter Rebbe's time, it's in the 1700s and the 1800s, beginning the 1800s, the Alter Rebbe expected people to daven at least an hour and a half, if not up, up to two hours. And those who want to daven have, just like Mark talks about, those who want longevity should spend more time in eating over a longer period of time, that is. When it comes to davening, Mark says the same thing. A person who wants to have longevity should daven longer than what most people, it takes most people to daven. So based on that, that's why the Alter Rebbe says when it comes to tefillin, because tefillin is connected with davening, it's going to be two to three hours, depending on if you're a regular davener, or if you're a longer davener. Those who are regular daveners are expected to daven close to two hours in the morning. And those who have more time, and they're called the, the ovdim, those who really do have more time to studying to davening, for them it was more than two hours. So therefore when it comes to the film, which is connected to davening, an interruption of, if you're a regular davener, so then two hours is called an interruption. If a person usually took you davening more than two hours, and there were people like that that took more than two hours, then for them, the interruption, if it was a three-hour interruption, that's called interruption. Then you have to make a new bracha. Less than that, you wouldn't have to make a new bracha. Yeah, in fact, Rebbe, in, his, in this work, cites the Gemara and Shrek that brachas. It tells us that the uh, Hasidim of old, of old, it's really pious Hasidim, it would take him three hours to daven every morning. One hour before Shemun Esrei. Shemun Esrei would be an hour one hour after Shemun Esrei. And the Gemara says, if they daven every day three hours, when do they study Torah? And the Gemara says, because they were chassidim, because they were very righteous and very devout, Kaddish Baruch saw to it that whatever they studied, they retained. They didn't forget. Most of us have a problem that we have to keep on repeating and reviewing and reviewing because we forget a lot. These were what would they call the older, the older chassidim who really spent a lot of time in medita- deep meditation and daven three hours each and every day at least for chakras and mincha marav also. So they have nine hours a day, many of them, some of them anyway. The, um, 
Now, the Rebbe continues in this idea of interruptions. We know that uh, there is a whole issue when a person, we get up in the morning, we make the bracha, al divrei Torah, or lasik with divrei Torah. We make a bracha over the study of Torah. A person we've mentioned so many times, a person just can't just study Torah. You've got to recognize that Torah is the divine wisdom. When a person studies Torah, you're actually engaging God, and you are embracing God, engaging God, holding on to God. And therefore, the rabbis made a special, more than one bracha, they have several brachas that we make over the giving of Torah, each and every day in the morning. Now, when a person goes to sleep in the daytime, there's no question whether he has to make a new bracha when he gets up. And according to some opinions, you don't have to sleep two, three hours, even if you sleep an hour, or even less than that, the person gets up and she's making a bracha. We don't do that. But there are opinions that the person does make a new bracha, even after less than an hour, which raises the question, when it comes to sleep, why is it that when it comes to sleeping, there are even a smaller interruption, it's called a, it's called a true interruption, which would require you to make a new bracha. So the, Rebbe said, so the Rebbe says, sleeping is different. Once a person is sleeping and your mind is totally out of it, because we're in, sort of say, in a different world, therefore a smaller interruption is also called a significant interruption, which requires you to make a new bracha. No. Just take a no. Okay. When it comes back, so, but the, but the primary Allah is, <coughs> the basic Allah though is, when it comes to going to sleep, when a person, when a person got up in the morning and made the bracha over the Torah, which was seen in the Siddur, Chabad I think it's page 8 and 9. So the primary Allah is that when a person makes a bracha in the morning, then you take a big nap, Shabbos afternoon, sometimes an hour and a half, two, two, two and a half hours. You don't make a new bracha. Even though we're talking about someone who was, he was asleep and therefore not aware of what was going on, and you would think, that, therefore, that, that that so perfect state, so to say, that would be that would constitute a real hefzik, a real separation. But the Rebbe says the reason that according to Allah you don't make a new bracha over the Torah is because the, the obligation to study Torah is so significant and so powerful that we look upon this individual, sure, he's sleeping now because he is very tired and he couldn't hold himself back, he had to sleep. But because there is a constant obligation to study Torah, therefore we look at this person at any moment as a person who's going to be getting up and studying Torah as soon as he can. And that's the reason that even a strong sleep, that yeah, I might have a, a strong nap, you taking a shower this afternoon, which might be for two, two and a half hours, but the fact is, you have this obligation to study as long as you uh, as long as you can during the daytime, and this very uh, powerful obligation rests upon you. And therefore, as soon as you get up, you don't have. There's no need to re- to repeat the bracha that you made in the morning of the learning of Torah. That bracha which you made initially, together with the powerful obligation to keep on studying Torah throughout the day, that itself allows you to get up and not make a new bracha and study Torah with the initial bracha that you made. But the other Rebbe says, the question becomes, what about someone who's not a scholar? A person who is not a person who is a scholar has an obligation of always studying Torah. And if we say that even though he's gone to sleep for two, two, two and a half hours, three hours, for t- he's taking a big, a big nap, but nevertheless, uh, because he always has this obligation of studying Torah every moment of his free time, there's no, therefore, there's no need for him to make a new bracha because the bracha that he made initially suffices for the entire day. But the Rebbe says, what about someone who's really not a scholar, not a student of Torah, doesn't know that much, can't learn Torah that much, he, just, he doesn't have the mechanics. And, um, <clears throat> and for someone like the other Rebbe writes in Tanya, if you look in chapter 8 of Tanya, there's a difference between Someone who is a scholar, and someone who is a scholar has an obligation of always studying Torah. Every free moment that he has, he has to make a living too. But aside from making a living and eating, a true scholar has an obligation of studying all the time. What about someone, the Rebbe says, what about someone who is not a true scholar? 
and really can't learn that much by himself. He just doesn't have the capacity, doesn't have, doesn't have the skills. And he doesn't have an obligation, he does not have the obligation of studying Torah every moment. So there'll be this question, why should it be, that person who takes a nap on Shabbos afternoon, a healthy nap, a strong nap, you would think when he gets up, for him now getting up and learning is a new experience. It's not just a continuation of an old experience. So the Rebbe said he wonders why such a person who is not really a scholar, why is it such a person on Shabbos afternoon would not have to make a new bracha when he gets up after a big nap? You would think that a big nap on Shabbos would be significant enough to serve as an interruption between the new mitzvah of the study of Torah and the bracha that you made in the beginning of the day. Then the Rebbe talks about something else. Let's say a person made a bracha on the study of Torah in the morning. And then let's say you find out 11 o'clock in the morning that you find out your father died, your mother died. And you go ahead and you bury that person right away. Because it's a to try to try to bury the person right away. You know, in America, many times people wait the next day. Because in America, as the rest of the world, we're able to notify relatives who live in, who live in a different state by coming to the, to the funeral. So they're going to plan. It takes them a day to get to, get to, the, to the to the funeral. But in the old days, when a person died in a small community in a small town, you couldn't notify relatives. So you're not going to wait for people coming from out of town. So you, you bury a person right away. That, that's the true mitzvah. So everything there for wonders. What will be a, a situation like this where a person made a bracha of the Torah, let's say, in the morning? Then ten o'clock, you find out your father died. And you bury the father one, two o'clock in the afternoon, three o'clock in the afternoon, and then you come back from the funeral. We know when a person is, um, when you lost the father, or mother, or a relative that you're obligated to, to, to sit shiva for. The halacha is you're not supposed to do any mitzvahs until the burial is over with, because right now your mitzvah is to see to it that this this relative is buried as soon as possible. Now there are opinions that if you have a, a qualified uh, funeral burial society, which is called the Hebrew Kaddish, taking care of the, of the burial, then you're absolved from that, and therefore you can do the mitzvahs. And there are those people who do mitzvahs. But the Alter Rebbe and Shulchan Aruch, the first Bible Shev Paschus, know that this is what we call basic respect to parents. If your parents die, your obligation now is not to do any other mitzvahs. Your mitzvah now is just to see to it the burial takes place as soon as possible. So in that situation, where a person, as I said, got up in the morning, he made the brachas of the Torah, then you find out your father dies, has died, burial right away, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you have the burial. During those five hours, you can't study Torah anyway, you can't do any mitzvahs, according to the Rebbe, even if there is a burial society, that's available. And then you come back from the funeral, and now you start doing mitzvahs, including studying the Torah, which you're able to study, a lot of Torah so you can't study, but there are certain parts of Torah you can study. So every one there is, what would the Allah be? Would you have to now make a new bracha over the Torah or not? Or over any mitzvah? That new mitzvah is going to start at this point. Well, that's what the that's what be said. So I did call an al. And all these issues, we talked about interruptions. In a situation where the person who just lost the relative before the burial, that person is called the Onan. Once there's a burial, it's called an Elvel, an Avelis. But before the burial, is called an Onan. So a person who became an Onan and um, buried his father right away, and at that point, until the burial, you are exempt from all mitzvahs, and then you come back from the funeral and you go back to mitzvahs, do we say that the brachas that we made beforehand are interrupted? As Rabbi said, the Chayr would seem that it should be an interruption, you would think, because if you can't do mitzvahs during those four or five hours, that certainly should be called an interruption. The Rebbe is not exactly sure. It's a Vitzorach in Adin. He's not sure about that. And that's where he ends off this, um, this letter, which, as I said before, is in chapter, volume 4 of the, of the Rebbe's uh, Kutisichas, page 1163, discussing the issue of brachas. Practically speaking, in terms of, for most of us, what, what is very relevant would be, as I said, the issue of uh, Yom Kippur, when we leave synagogue, usually after Musaf, before we come back from, Min- from Mincha, it's around two and a half hours. So the Alter Rebbe writes, unless it's many hours, you don't make a new bracha when it comes to talis. So for most of us, 
In fact, for all of us, we were not making a bracha when we put on the talus again before the mincha service of Yom Kippur, which is around, let's say, quarter six this year. A new bracha would not be needed because the interruption was smaller than many hours. Smaller than many hours, it is. Any questions?